How did a minor archaeological debate become a battleground for the Bible itself? Stay tuned and find out on this episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. Today's video was requested by Orthodox of the USA, who asked me to discuss the early date of the Exodus. Thank you very much for your question, Orthodox of the USA. And if you like these videos and my willingness to answer your questions on Egypt and the Bible, please hit that subscribe button. It really helps the channel. Now, sometimes questions have bigger implications than they might appear at first blush. The date of the Exodus is one such question. It's a bit like asking someone to give an opinion on Western Christianity. The topic is very big, with a lot of issues. So to give you a comprehensive answer, I need to build a foundation to give you a really thorough and well thought out answer. So my producer and I have decided to turn this question into a six part series to try to cover all the bases. On its surface, the Exodus question seems like a dry academic debate over a date. And if this were just about a date, all we would need to do is compare the text to the archaeology and call it a day. And there are a lot of these minor debates in biblical studies, and most don't garner a lot of attention or interest. But this debate really isn't about a date. The date is just a proxy over an interpretive method, also called a hermeneutic. That interpretive method claims to read the Bible literally and claims that the historicity of the Bible itself is at stake. Yet every once in a while, a tradition or teaching perhaps introduced for the best of reasons, will end up compromising the integrity of Scripture. A famous historical example of this is Apollinarianism. In the 4th century AD, Apollinaris taught that Christ was fully God, but the mind of Christ was not really human. His teaching was a reaction to the heresy of Arianism, which taught that Christ was a created being. Apollinaris thought he was defending the Bible, and in attempting to refute Arianism and establish the Nicene faith, he only created a new heresy. He did the wrong thing for the right reasons, but it was still the wrong thing. In a similar fashion, the early date of the Exodus was a debate introduced with the best of intentions. It was a way to get people to read the Bible in a literal fashion, in response to liberal theology and Wellhausen's documentary hypothesis. But it does miss the mark. So, let's begin our examination of the early Exodus view with a bit of a historical perspective. Now, the specific version of the early Exodus view we will be discussing over the next several videos asserts that the Exodus took place in 1446 BC under the reign of Egyptian king Amenhotep II. There are other early views of the Exodus, but this one is by and large the most influential. Before 1906, no one had ever heard of an early date of the Exodus. The late 14th, early 13th century date for the Exodus was considered the accepted view since the 4th century AD. And even though Bishop Usher had published an earlier Exodus date in 1650, no one really took that seriously because it was based upon lunar dating and a 4004 BC age of the Earth. During the late 19th century, Liberal theology and Julius Wellhausen were undermining the authority of Scripture with assertions that the Old Testament was being continuously redacted 
that is edited until the Babylonian period. Then in 1906, Scottish theologian James Orr published his book defending traditional readings of scripture and attacking Wellhausen's assertions. The book was highly praised and won several awards. He even conducted several speaking tours across America. And all that would have been fine, except he inserted into his book what he called a new theory. That new theory stated that one could take the 480th year in 1 Kings 6 1 and add that number to the date of Solomon's temple to date the Exodus to the 15th century BC, and that Egyptian king Amenhotep II was the pharaoh spoken of in the scriptures. In short, Or took one verse of scripture and elevated it in importance over the rest of scripture. Students of the Bible will recognize the old adage that a text without a context becomes a pretext for a proof text. And we will return to this problem in a later video. Well, it didn't take long before Orr's new theory and one-verse hermeneutic began to face problems. It was quickly noticed that Egyptian chronology and the mention of, quote, Ramses in Exodus 111, 1237, and Numbers 33, 3 and 5 didn't line up with Orr's early date. Orr's supporters replied that new discoveries were being made all the time in Egypt and that Egyptian chronology could swing back into Orr's favor. In 1925, J.W. Jack published his own book on the early Exodus date, essentially plagiarizing Orr's ideas. But he offered a different solution to the Ramses problem. Instead of denying Wellhausen's documentary hypothesis, he fully embraced it. He said that instances of Ramses were redacted into the text by later editors. Jack's book was a bestseller. While his solution kept the early date view on life support, many people were uneasy with Jack's support of Wellhausen because of the implications that this had for biblical inerrancy. Then in 1969, David Livingston, not to be confused with the famous 19th century missionary to Africa, started Associates for Biblical Research, ABR. He was swayed by Orr and Jack, but downplayed the Wellhausen connection. ABR was organized as a missions and evangelism organization to promote a notion of biblical chronology based upon a 20th century Western American reading of the Bible. Livingston did not debate his ideas in the academic sphere. Instead, he went from church to church selling his ideas. At first, ABR's message was that archaeology proved American biblical chronology and the early Exodus date. However, new discoveries were made in Egypt, and Egyptian chronology improved. But the evidence took an irreversible turn against the early Exodus date. Yet, ABR quickly forged alliances with creationist groups which gave their views an instant in, with churches of a more fundamentalist persuasion. Then for 50 years, ABR told people that they were championing a high view of scripture, inerrancy, and a literal interpretive approach. And others 
who disagreed were attacking the Bible, trampling tradition, and spreading deadly heresy. So even though the early Exodus view had virtually no support among ancient Near Eastern scholars, ABR's teaching had locked up grassroots support at the lay, pastoral, denominational, and even seminary levels. But what happens when an impossible hermeneutic is imposed over an errant text? You cannot hold to both an impossible hermeneutic and an inerrant text at the same time without something breaking. And indeed, something broke. So what happened was, ABR would tell people, read the Bible literally. And then someone would ask, what about Psalm 91.4? Does God literally have wings and feathers? Is God a chicken? And they would reply, read the Bible literally, except that one verse. Then some other wag would come along and say, well, what about John 10.9? I am the door. Is Christ literally made of wood planks and hinges? They would reply then, read the Bible literally, except those two verses. And as the exceptions accumulated, those two verses eventually became those verses. But when the archaeological evidence that contradicted their notion of American biblical chronology began to show up, it became just a little too easy to say except those verses. When faced with it, the inconsistencies between 1 Kings 6.1 and Exodus 1.11, they would say, read the Bible literally, except for Ramses. Read that as a virus. The problem is, without a nuanced method of interpretation for what is meant by literally, the quote, except those verses, end quote, became the early Exodus's views real hermeneutic. It is an ad hoc method of interpretation, which means that any verse ends up meaning whatever they want it to mean. And this has the potential to turn scripture into an unhistorical mess. Therefore, we have to understand that the debate over the date of the Exodus is not really about a date. The debate is actually about how we interpret the Bible. Specifically, it is a debate between a distinctly 20th century American method of interpretation based upon biblical chronology versus the historical grammatical method of interpretation. The problem is that while both views say they respect biblical inerrancy and the historicity of the Bible, one view compromises those ideals. Here, then, is the real problem and why this issue is so important. When we talk about the early date of the Exodus, we are not just talking about a date in history. I agree with the early date supporters that this is about the very historicity of the Bible itself, and that is what is at stake. Next time, we will discuss the assumptions that are used in the early Exodus view, and particularly the role that American biblical chronology plays. If you found this video educational, please consider supporting this channel and hitting the subscribe button below. Thank you for watching and see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible.